All right, so today I'll be talking about how organs and tissues respond to environmental changes. These changes occur at the cellular level, so we call them cellular adaptations. As you know, many of our organ systems are regulated to maintain homeostasis. And in this video, I'm going to discuss changes that result from excess stress or prolonged disuse. In the image we have in the middle here, we can see an organ, in this case, the bicep muscle in the arm. If the bicep muscle is constantly stressed, such as during strength training, the muscle can experience hypertrophy, in which it increases in size to the larger bicep on the left. If the muscles aren't used for an extended period of time, which might be the case for handicapped or bedridden patients, the muscles might undergo atrophy, which is a decrease in size to the muscle on the right. I'll be discussing the mechanisms that can cause changes like the ones shown here. Let's start with mechanisms in which tissues and thus organs are enlarged or become bigger. There are two ways this can happen. The first is hypertrophy, literally meaning overnourishment, which is an increase in the size of cells making up a tissue or organ. You can see this left side of the diagram where the four cells are increased in size during hypertrophy. The second way an organ can become enlarged is through hyperplasia, which literally means overformation of cells. So the cells are becoming more numerous. On the right side of the diagram, you can see the cells multiplying as they go from four cells to 12 cells. There's an increase in the number of cells. Again, this is in contrast to the cells increasing in size during hypertrophy on this side. One last thing to note is that oftentimes hypertrophy and hyperplasia occur together. So when an organ increases in size in the body, we are really seeing an increase in the size and number of cells. An example of hypertrophy and hyperplasia occurring together is in the growth of the uterus during pregnancy. Now, in order to have hypertrophy, the cell volume needs to physically increase. In a normal animal cell, a protein structure known as a cytoskeleton is what holds up the cell membrane to maintain cell shape and rigidity. This is a microscope image of cells where the cytoskeleton components are stained red and green, and you can see how they kind of stretch out the plasma membrane and define the cell size and volume. So, to increase the cell size, this cytoskeleton needs to become bigger. Because the cytoskeleton is made up of protein, the process of hypertrophy requires increased protein production, which of course means the activation of more genes to synthesize those proteins. A larger cell also requires more organelles spread about the cell to produce ATP, remove wastes, synthesize molecules, and do everything else that organelles do. This means that organelle production increases during hypertrophy as well. An example of pathologic hypertrophy is in the ventricles of the heart, as shown in this picture down here. We see a substantial increase in the walls of the right ventricle in this heart right here. This occurs when the heart struggles to pump blood to the body during heart failure, or when a person has chronic hypertension. Hypertrophy in the walls of a hollow organ or chamber is called eccentric hypertrophy, and the word eccentric here means away from the center. The walls surrounding the chamber, in this case, the chamber is the right ventricle, are enlarged because of increased stress on the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps blood to the pulmonary circulation, so a person with this condition might have pulmonary hypertension, or COPD. Hyperplasia, or the increase in cell number, is a bit simpler to explain. Hyperplasia is essentially increased cell proliferation, or mitosis, and the cells are usually dividing and differentiating themselves from a set of stem cells. Normal, or physiologic hyperplasia, occurs in the body and is often triggered by hormones, cytokines, or other signaling molecules. One example of normal hyperplasia is the proliferation of the milk ducts in response to increased estrogen during pregnancy. Estrogen and progesterone also trigger the milk-producing alveolar epithelium for breastfeeding. Pathologic hyperplasia includes benign prostate hyperplasia, or BPH, this condition, more commonly known as prostate enlargement, is shown down here, and it often causes urinary issues in men. And of course, cancer metastases are a form of hyperplasia, and this moving image here is a proliferation of skin cells from mice. Next, we have two mechanisms in which tissues can waste away or shrink, and they are both called atrophy. Atrophy can refer to either a decrease in size 
or a decrease in number of cells. Both of these mechanisms, whether it be the cells decreasing in volume or cells decreasing in quantity, are called atrophy, which is different from organ growth, as we saw earlier. The roots of the word atrophy come from Greek, and it literally means without nourishment, and it follows that a lack of nourishment or food is essentially what causes atrophy. This lack of nourishment can be a result of disuse, poor circulation, decreased hormonal support, or decreased nerve supply. Organs and tissues are typically in homeostasis, and a given set of cells might be performing a certain function, but when they experience a decrease in pressure, such as less exercise or decreased hormonal stimulation, atrophy can occur if the organ requires less of that function. This kind of echoes the use it or lose it expression. And of course, much like hypertrophy and hyperplasia, atrophy can be physiological or pathological in nature, and we'll discuss examples of both. Now, atrophy that results in a decrease in the size of cells occurs by a catabolic pathway. In order for cells to get smaller, they must break down the cytoskeleton that is maintaining the structure and shape of the cell. The breakdown of cytoskeletons is known as the ubiquitin proteasome degradation pathway. And we're going to work through it here. The cytoskeleton is made up of proteins, such as actin and tubulin, arranged in various configurations. Ubiquitin, which comes in here, is a signaling molecule that targets the protein that's about to get chopped up. In this case, the green and orange zigzagging spheres are going to get cut up. So the ubiquitin molecule comes in, the blue Pac-Man, locks onto the target protein, and signals for the next step. The next step is the entrance of the purple proteasome. Proteasome is the big protein complex that performs the degradation. So proteasome is degradating the, uh, the cytoskeleton where ubiquitin tagged it, and the cytoskeleton breaks apart. Let's watch this one more time. We start with the proteins that make up the cytoskeleton. Ubiquitin comes in and tags a section of the cytoskeleton for degradation. The ubiquitin molecule signals for the proteasome to make its way over to chop up the protein. And in the end, the ubiquitin and proteasome dissociate, and the cytoskeleton protein has been degraded. Secondly, we have atrophy characterized by a decrease in the number of cells. The primary mechanism for this is through apoptosis, or the process of programmed cell death. Some of the mechanistic pathways for apoptosis are known, and it's still an active area of research. There are, of course, various molecules that promote or inhibit apoptosis, and these molecules must constantly be kept in check to prevent pathologic atrophy of our tissues and organs. Shown right here is a 61-hour time-lapse of a prostate cancer cell undergoing apoptosis. You can see this cell right here undergoing cell death. An example of atrophy in the body during normal human development is the shrinking of the thymus. This is called thymic involution. The thymus, as you might know, is an organ involved in T-cell production for our immune system. This organ begins to shrink before puberties as the levels of sex steroids in the body increase. As the thymus shrinks, T cells circulating the body must divide and proliferate on their own. Some studies extrapolate this shrinking and conclude that if the thymus continues to atrophy as a person ages, it'll stop functioning at age 105 and completely disappear by age 120. So we've talked about growth adaptations in which tissues become bigger such as hypertrophy and hyperplasia. We've also talked about growth adaptations where tissues become smaller through atrophy. Now let's discuss another way that cells adapt to a changing environment through metaplasia. Metaplasia literally means a change in formation or a change of cell type. Metaplasia is a change in the kind of cells that make up a tissue. The differentiated cells in a tissue are replaced with another type of cell. Now, why would the cells of a tissue want to change in type? Like the previous growth adaptations, it's usually a result of abnormal environmental change, such as when existing cells of the tissue cannot withstand a new stress. The best example of metaplasia is Barrett's esophagus, in which the epithelial cells of the esophagus undergo a change in cell type. The cells lining the esophagus are usually in stratified squamous form, as you can see up here. They are flattened cells arranged in layers. 
When these epithelial cells are overexposed to acid, such as gastric acid from the stomach, they are replaced by a column-shaped or columnar cells, as shown down here. These columnar cells, also called goblet cells, are usually found in the lower GI tract and are better suited to acid exposure. The stratified squamous cells are overexposed to stress, in this case that stress is acid, and they are replaced with cells to adapt the tissue to that stress. Barrett's esophagus often appears in patients with chronic acid reflux, which explains the abnormal stress. It's important to note that metaplasia is usually reversible, so if the issue is fixed, such as if we reduce the acid exposure, the goblet cells can gradually be replaced by the normal squamous cells. And of course, this constant changing in cell type can increase your risk for esophageal cancer. Here's a brief summary of what we've discussed in this video. We start with an original set of four standard size cells. During hypertrophy, these four cells increase in cell size. You can see them getting bigger from these four cells to these four cells, and this is called hypertrophy. During hyperplasia, we have an increase in the number of cells as we go from four cells up here to six cells down here. During atrophy, we can have a decrease in cell size, a decrease in the number of cells, or some combination of the two. Atrophy means both a decrease in cell size or a decrease in the number of cells. And lastly, during metaplasia, we see a change in cell type as these square-shaped cells become more circular during metaplasia. So that's all I got for these slides on growth adaptations. Thank you for joining me, and be sure to check out my other videos.